Um, so do you guys see my screen? Uh, Dan, now you need to switch on your microphone just to say I, yes. I know, I know. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We, we can. Perfect. Thank you so much. It works. <laughs> okay. I'm That's fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, so, well, this, this lecture, well, it's a, it's a, rather than a lecture, is more of a, of a kind of a tra train of thoughts, kind of a sticks together. Um, and uh, it kind of goes from um, one hat to another and, uh, and, and through the, the connections uh, in between some of the different work that I'm, I'm doing uh, in, uh, let's say, different uh, companies, institutions, uh, practices, and so on. Uh, just as a brief introduction of, uh, of myself, I, I, I run a, a design practice called uh, Madden Design. Uh, that has been going on for the last uh, eight years. Um, I'm also a co-founder and co-director of uh, our uh, Automated Architecture LTD, right? Which is a, um, a design uh, consultancy focusing, obviously, on, on automation. Um, and uh, I, I also run a, a, a research lab in UCL. Uh, this, um, Last two are together with uh, Molly Claypool and, and Dean Redsin, uh, who are also involved in uh, digital uh, futures. And then I, I also have a, a robotic manufacturing uh, company, Slash uh, Design Brand, that I will explain in, in, more, in more detail. And it's based in, in Spain. Uh, it's called Nagami. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the kind of uh, what well, stitches all the, all the work is, uh, well, I would say a fascination about the uh, automation technology, but, but more a fascination about design uh, with automation, which uh, uh, will be kind of the, the, the topic explored in, in, in this lecture with some glimpses of what, what we do in, in, in the lab with the, with the students in a professional field and, and in the more uh, commercial kind of setup. Um, so, well, design and computation has always uh, been uh, interwoven in this. And um, um, in fact, like, uh, for example, uh, Nicolas Negroponti, right, an architect, created a MIT uh, um, or the Architecture Machine Group that, that then farther down the line became the, the MIT Media Lab. Uh, so there is always this kind of fascination for technology, but also understanding it from a, from a design perspective that I think make our contribution uh, to, the, to the field of, of uh, uh, technological advances um, very, very valuable. Um, this is how, um, well, this is not how our workshops are uh, looking today, uh, but before the, before the pandemic, of course. Uh, so today is very normal that the, the, the architect or the architecture student, like in this case, in, in our lab in UCL, uh, is just working side by side with the, with the uh, tools that we have, right? So we have a different understanding on what a machine uh, uh, can do and uh, how we should design for and with it. Um, but uh, just to, to, to kind of go back for, for a, few, a few decades, right? Uh, as uh, we were uh, discussing before in the, in the qu quick interview, um, there have been different stages in, uh, let's say, the, the stylistic evolution of architecture, um, which, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the latest one probably going from, from modernism uh, to the, the use of, of digital tools, right? Uh, however, there was not really a, a syntactical uh, kind of challenge here. As, as you can, if you compare these two models, the, the, the main difference is that the, the one on the right is, is smooth. But the structure behind it, its bones, are, um, are absolutely identical. Therefore, their syntax uh, are also identical. Um, the, the very early um, kind of uh, use of uh, uh, digital tools for, for architecture, what started to be called digital architecture, just because we were using digital tools, and I, I will expand on that, uh, was uh, uh, kind of led by, by uh, Greg Lin, uh, with the use of Bessier lines, right? Uh, as, as Bessier kind of revolutionized the, the, the car industry, right? Like all of a sudden we could model 
uh, double curvatures with uh, in in the computer, and then we can mass produce uh, those designs rather than go from uh, clay models to to reality. Um, architecture all of a sudden became curvilinear, became uh, continuous, uh, became became fluid, right? And um, um, basically because of what what uh, um, a Bezier a curve would allow you. Uh, to, to mathematically comprehend and therefore replicate in reality farther on, right? And so it's an architecture that, that can uh, change, that is, uh, is uh, completely fluid and that can generate an entire multiplicity of uh, different objects, right? Um, so yeah, this was uh, Greg Lean's approach back then. It's uh, like the comparison between the, the um, Euclidean model, right? where uh, a continuous curve will be described by uh, a small uh, 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 circles, right? Um, to actually understanding that curve as a, as a continuous mathematical expression guided by control points, right? Um, however, the, um, uh, the nature, as, as uh, our friend Ma Ma Mario Carpo describes very well, uh, the inherent discreteness of nature is unavoidable, right? So uh, nature is discrete and uh, architecture is indeed discrete. And to make a continuous curve, you will still have to, one way or another, break it into parts, right? Uh, so I think some of our, or most, most of the work that I will be, I will be showing, and um, most of the argument, uh, relies on, on the, the re-understanding of, of that part rather than re-understanding the whole and then breaking it into parts in a post-rationalization process. Uh, but so when, when this kind of like passion for continuity commenced in the, in the late 90s, um, architects such as uh, uh, Lars in, in, in Knox, for example, or uh, I mean others like uh, Saha Hadid and so on, um, started to uh, envision a space that is purely continuous, right? That, that doesn't have visible parts, right? It, 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 it is fluid from uh, floor to, to wall to, to ceiling, and it's giving you a completely different notion of space. Um, however, as, as, as we were um, kind of hinting before, uh, those early experiments that were materialized mainly in, in pavilions and in small pieces of architecture um, became, uh, you know, real large scale buildings 10 years uh, down the line uh, with protagonists uh, such as Saha Hadid that, uh, or Frank Gehry that we were describing before. Uh, but, but following um, very, very um, kind of predictable uh, post-rationalization te uh, techniques. Right? There are three main different ways to materialize uh, a double curvature at that scale. Uh, one is panelize it, which will lead to having uh, a, an, an enormous set of, uh, of uh, different panels. Uh, waffling it, which I, will, I think I will dig a little bit more in, in, in detail. Uh, so cutting this object in, in uh, a Cartesian way, uh, or slicing it, right? And, and these methods have been followed in a, in a large variety of scales from uh, furniture to architecture, but the entire, let's call it digital architecture uh, community. Um, however, these, uh, I mean, these, these tools, as, as, this, as I described before, as, as post-rationalization tools, um, allow you to not only build this architecture, but actually almost build anything in three dimensions. But it does have implications. So all the, um, every single product that you are generating has a complete different set of pieces. And we, within the object, uh, all those pieces are different to, to create the effect of, uh, of continuity. Um, this has a, a serious uh, economical uh, implications, right? And uh, so the, not, not only in the, in the production of these pieces, which we can certainly do with, the, with digital prototyping tools, uh, however, mainly in the assembly. Um, so it is necessary uh, to reduce uh, cost and, and to speed up um, assembly time uh, to generate shorter families of elements that can be put together 
in this double curve set. Like for example, this is this is one of the most still cutting edge uh, use of uh, of um, machine learning in architecture, which is actually for rationalizing these panels so that you can uh, reduce the number the number of uh, families used. Um, however, a completely different approach is uh, that one followed in, in other industries, actually, certainly not, not in architecture, but very close uh, and guided by architects. Uh, like in certain for uh, bits and atoms, uh, when, uh, where Neil Gersenfeld is kind of envisioning um, um, a single piece that could be connected in, in a large variety of ways, leading to a completely different behavior. So the same object, or uh, created out of the an assemblage of just this single piece, depending on, on the way this piece is connected in different parts, it will have greater flexibility, it will be stiffer or not. It will, you can alter the properties of this object, uh, um, not because of the, the part itself, but because of the way this part is connected to uh, its, the rest of the parts, right? Um, so, for instance, um, this uh, is uh, an evolution of the project that I was describing before, how these uh, um, uh, plane wings uh, can alter their flexibility depending on the connection of the, the species in one part or, or another. Um, yeah, so uh, the, uh, he, he kind of uh, uh, describes this as a, as a digital material, as a truly digital material, right? And, and here is when we start to envision uh, the kind of uh, first, um, you know, a, a strange uh, familiarity in, in the names, right? The, like digital architecture versus, versus digital material. Well, if we would follow uh, Neil uh, Gersenfeld's uh, statement, what we were calling digital architecture until now is in a sense not digital. It's making use of digital tools uh, to create an yet conventional architecture uh, syntactically and a truly digital architecture will be made of uh, digital materials which is a limited set of, uh, of pieces with a limited uh, number of connection possibilities. And the, the closer uh, example that we have to such a material is actually not in architecture, it's Lego, right? It's a, it's a piece that is versatile enough to be connected in many different uh, uh, positions. So out of a single piece, you can create an, an entire large uh, plethora of uh, uh, different objects. And farther on, you can still reutilize these pieces to change the overall shape of the object. Um, so yeah, that's something kind of explored in, the, in these projects. And uh, as you can see, I, I don't want to go so much in detail in here, but you can see like the, the differentiation in behavior just uh, leading from uh, the different connectivity between these pieces, right? You have uh, an area that is uh, denser and that will remain stiffer and another area that can uh, accept a higher degree of, of, of flexibility. Um, so, so some of the questions that we, we actually share with this statement, uh, are towards starting to think of a construction of buildings as uh, something materially cheaper and accessibly uh, and accessible and as versatile as democra and democratic as digital data. So can digital materials uh, be, you know, as easily produced and, and, and assembled into architecture as digital data is dis distributed over over the internet that is obviously a larger question that we we will kind of uh, explore in more detail um in in further stages of the of the lecture uh but uh, let's say coming back to uh, what the states of uh, actually all disciplines uh, is uh, or, uh, at the at the moment um this is not the landscape that we just have today yeah this is uh, uh, not what is making possible to make a tesla Right. Um, what uh, may, may, this is what made possible to streamline the production of cars. Yeah, and is is the is the um, the natural derivative of uh, uh, Henry Ford's model. Right. It's an assembly line that now is even cheaper because most of those stages are automated. Therefore, our production costs can go lower. 
uh, the final price of the product is also lower. Therefore, that product is more accessible and it will have a wider impact in society. Um, so, and this is happening in many other disciplines, right? Like uh, this is, for example, in the food industry, right? That's Ocado. This is uh, Amazon. So the, the reason why um, we are having an overall impact um, on uh, uh, the, these, these companies in their uh, uh, specific sector is because of the efficiency of, of uh, automation. Um, however, uh, architecture and construction remains as uh, incredibly wasteful, dangerous. It's actually not something made for, for humans. Like we were not made to be in a, in a 30 story building kind of bare, bare uh, to the bones just connected with a, with a string uh, to a, a building in construction, right? So there, there is something in between the scale we operate and the materials that we use that make uh, human, humans probably not the most efficient agent for uh, taking this uh, work on board. Um, so obviously auto automation will, uh, will allow us to reduce uh, waste, uh, to reduce danger in a, a human labor, injuries, and, and dirty, dirty work. Um, however, this is the current stage. This is where we are, right? Um, so if you kind of spot construction, in, um, in this graph on the, on the left, is right above agriculture and hunting, right? Um, so, which is at, the very, it's at the very bottom on the kind of the assimilation of, of uh, digital and automation technologies in, in, in the discipline. Um, to be honest, this is actually not even true because in the, in the East, agriculture is fully automated. And obviously, I mean, hunting uh, would not be fun if you automate it. So, uh, let's say we are right now at the very, very bottom of, the, of this graph. Um, at the same time, the, um, the efficiency on, architect, uh, on construction is decreasing, right? And uh, we can't really cope, cope with the demands of, of buildings, especially in housing, right? So it is incredible, I think, yeah, there's another graph here, uh, how you see the, like, there is an obvious increase in demand of, uh, on housing. There's an increase in population. This, this is an example in the UK, which is um, uh, also kind of leading the inefficiency uh, states right now. Um, so we are producing less, less and less and less uh, housing every year. We are less and less and less efficient than before. Uh, whereas other disciplines are, are increasing efficiency thanks to the introduction mainly of uh, automation uh, principles, right? Um, so uh, let's say to, to compare it to uh, the, the previous industrial revolution, if you take today and uh, you take automation and, and industry 4.0 as, as a new revolution in industry, um, in, the, in the industrial revolution, uh, the industrial revolution basically led to modernism, right? Like all of a sudden we could mass produce pieces that we can assemble together into into be beautiful buildings right and but it, it wasn't about the style it, it was not about uh making a you know straight lines and, and slowly they materializing them um it, it was a result of a new industrial process that now became available for architecture and, and, and we develop i mean we had the creativity uh, to, to filter this through and see what is the, the natural way of building architecture that will result from it. And um, it was also a social uh, movement, right? Like this, this house was actually for a, for a school teacher. Uh, obviously right now its value is completely disconnected to the cost of construction because, uh, because of many, many, many reasons and, and the, the uh, in, incredible cost of, of, line, of, uh, of land in, in Beverly Hills, right? But, um, but the, 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 the kind of the, the overall thinking behind creating these pieces of architecture is that it will be cheaper with the industry that we have. It will be more efficient and it would also uh, contribute to an evolution in, in style as a result of it. Um, however, this is the this is the current uh, uh, yeah state of uh, of industry. So this is the, the equivalent to the industrial revolution, right uh, right before that. Um, and uh, this is the like the cutting edge 
uh, the use of this technology for architecture, right? So this image is, is Katera, um, who are actually probably, uh, yeah, leading the discourse in automation, uh, in automating uh, architecture or automating construction. So this, these houses are truly automated, but they are not rethinking at all any of the fundamentals of, of the, the underlying architecture behind, right? So we try to automate processes that we had before. Whereas in the modernism, we kind of created a new, new architecture that would go hand by hand by, uh, with, the, um, with the technical development that, that, that we were having, right? And so and this, this makes us um, kind of uh, start thinking uh, where uh, automation should be dealing and, and what is the agency of the architect in leading this discourse. Like as I'm, I'm showing in this, in this image here, um, architects are right now out of the equation. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley and, and uh, engineers and investors are actually leading the, the progress towards uh, automation in, in, in architecture. Whereas the, the fundamental uh, problem uh, is or the, 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 the fun fundamentals of what automation can do for us is indeed a design problem. And uh, that is actually what is uh, um, like taken as a, uh, almost as a given in, a, in extreme environments, right? Um, like in, a, you know, um, reaching, reaching out to the stars and, uh, and inhabiting hostile environments uh, such as Mars, right, are, is, is dealing to, a, to an incredible uh, amount of, uh, of uh, ideas on how to optimize this process to the very maximum, right? Uh, from uh, pneumatic um, uh, structures that could be flat packed uh, to 3D printing strategies, right? Can we actually utilize the, the uh, lunar soil or Mars soil uh, to 3D print with it so we don't have to ship objects? Uh, or even, um, again, uh, the Center for Bits and Atoms uh, initiative on uh, how to automate uh, the, the, um, or how to do automated assembly of the structures, right? And, uh, and they, they do kind of state from the very beginning uh, with what, what I think is a fundamental shift in the thinking of, of how, how we are automating architecture. We're not automating architecture. We are actually created an automated architecture and that is completely different. Uh, you need to, for example, in here, reduce the number of parts so that we, we can uh, create automation protocols for them. And this could be reconfigured in a multiplicity of structures when they are erected in the, in, uh, out, the outer space, right? Um, however, this is, uh, let's say now down to earth again. And this is again, cutting edge and, and super incredibly interesting uh, research. But so these are different aspects of the building industry that um, researchers from all over the world are investigating on how to automate, right? From uh, the brick placement, from uh, to cladding, to structure, to textiles, right? Um, to uh, tiling, right? Like there's this uh, group in, in, in Korea with like four PhD students researching how to automate tiling. But um, if you, you, you can realize that we are talking about uh, bricks, we are talking about structure, we are talking about tiles, we are uh, talking about text, we, we are talking about the multiplicity of things. Because uh, a, a building is incredibly complex in its number of architectural elements. So if, if you would take the 7,000 different parts that I, as an average you could find in a building, and, and you want to automate all of them as we conceive them today, uh, that will lead to uh, 7,000 different automate, uh, automated processes, which you can multiply by the number of PhD students, and uh, it will be quite a nightmare to, to get it on. So the question is, uh, if we would manage to reduce architecture to, obviously this is over ambitious, but if we would manage to reduce architecture to a single part, uh, then we would have a, a single uh, automated process, which would mean perhaps that we can manage, right? Um, so 
let's say um, uh, some of our, again, uh, not only our research, but then in, in other uh, industry, they are applying this, uh, this concept of playing out uh, the complexity, like formal complexity from combinatorial processes rather than from the, the geometry of the pieces uh, themselves. Like, this is the case of um, Disney research, for instance. This is a, a um, uh, 3D, 3D printing uh, uh, research for printing toys, right? Uh, one of the challenges in printing toys is how do you uh, print articulations? Right, uh, like they always lead to you know all these problems on like matching geometry and so on, overhangs if you are trying to uh, print in F in FDN. Um, but in this case, you can actually control the the flexibility of the material just not because of a change in material, not because of a change in shape, but actually for a change in the particle that is conforming the, uh, that object in that specific area. So by the, uh, defining a range of different particles or different boxes in this case with different densities, you can control the local flexibility of this object. And uh, I think that was, that's extremely interesting. This is something that uh, uh, Mario is also uh, exploring in one, what he's calling the, the second digital turn um, in, a, in, in, in architecture. But, uh, but also started to hint a, a, a third term, right? Which is how we went from, you know, the use of, of the shear curves uh, to then start to, to deal with computation in a, in a, in a more um, kind of me mess messy way, how we understood computation as, as, as dealing with, uh, with atoms, particles, agents, pixels, right? And, and how this is now, leading to understand the industry as a whole, not just within the spectrum of, of, of design, but also within the overall arch of, of uh, construction, right? Uh, which again, um, yeah, the, the most similar kind of example uh, still is, is Lego though. Uh, this is something, so this is like a, a, like a contra kind of, a, the, these uh, two examples are completely opposed, uh, right? So, um, on, on the left hand side, you, you have the, a post rationalization exercise, right? So you, you have a surface that then you can waffle in both, both directions and construct with unique uh, pieces combined. Uh, but then the question is uh, what is the overall core for the overall object that will, uh, you will achieve if you start from the piece in itself uh, rather than from the surface that you, you want to reach? So that's a completely different understanding on uh, um, uh, uh, the way a curve is composed, for example. And, and this, I mean, here, I, I mean, I reference uh, my colleague, uh, Jill Retzin, uh, that runs the, the lab with me in UCL, on uh, how, how we can actually start, rather than trying to recreate this curve, approximate the curve from the combination of identical pieces. And, uh, and posing a new question that is, um, can we achieve heterogeneity in an object coming from, from the same piece? Before, we, the, the question was completely reversed, right? We were, we were basically saying, well, can we achieve complexity uh, with the use of these tools? And then there was a second afterthought is that, okay, and now how can we materialize that complexity? Now we're reversing the question completely and saying, well, we know that we can create a single piece. We know that we can assemble these pieces together. Let's see what we can do. Can we do what we wanted to do in a, in a, in a first stage when complexity was about uh, the overall object and not about the, the way its pieces are connected? And that is something that we're, yeah, we're certainly exploring uh, mainly in uh, our company, Automated Architecture, and in uh, this site computation lab. And that makes use also of uh, 3D printing with, with Nagami in, in, in certain areas that I will uh, explain further on uh, to advance this research in, in parallel, right? Um, so yeah, this is, um, I mean, I'm gonna go through uh, a, a few of the projects that we've uh, created in the, in the lab. Let's say that this first half of the lecture will be more focusing on, on, on research with the lab and the second part of the, of the lecture will be more Nagami-based and a little bit more turned down to the actual 
the actual reality and how we use these technologies uh, today uh, outside an academic framework. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the lab is obviously incredibly interesting in, interested in, in automation, but uh, what is fundamental for us is actually the way this material organization is occurring, right? So there is a, a back and forth continuously between the, the automation tool and the, the, the material that, that this tool is allowing to combine within an object, right? And we, deal, we do that with a, a large variety of, um, of uh, uh, materials and different processes. But as I was kind of like framing uh, before in the lecture, we're also following these uh, two main trends uh, that are right now more present in outer space than, than, than in planet Earth, which is uh, 3D printing and uh, robotic assembly, uh, which we again kind of uh, develop always in, in, in parallel. Uh, within the, the commercial and the uh, research projects that we do in the lab and, and, and the company. But essentially, the, these, these two processes are based on the exact same distance, right? Whereas this piece that conforms the architecture is, um, is a line fragment that will be 3D printed or is, is a wooden block, syntactically, it's an identical process. And I, I will explain that uh, further in a second. Uh, for example, and, and this, uh, this project that kind of like opened up uh, uh, a huge part of the, of, of the discourse, and uh, it was about solving a very specific problem, right? Um, we wanted to print a continuous line, but we wanted that line to generate a heterogeneity, right? And we, we had the problem on uh, making sure that the line will be printable at every single stage. I will, I will navigate into uh, that in more detail in, in, my, in my second uh, lecture with the voxel chair. Uh, but basically the question here is, if you can generate a line and prototype it in the 24 different rotations, then you know that that line fragment will be always printable. So that's what we did in the, now look at, looking at this, this was a, a, one of the very, very first uh, plastic extruders that, that we developed at the, uh, at the lab. Um, but the, the process was actually incredibly efficient. So this line could alter its, like the overall density of the, of the object in a certain area just by subdividing the voxel that contains it or not, right? Um, and, and you can start achieving this gradient of density, right? When, when the line becomes more and more and more divided, it almost becomes a point uh, that then connects to another point into a denser line, right? Uh, but when it blows up in a scale, then it exhibits this uh, porosity uh, that is, uh, is allowing these uh, areas to be much more permeable. Um, yeah, again, coming back to, or shifting to uh, kind of a very similar method, but within not only a discrete design methodology, but also discrete fabrication methodology, right? So the advantage that you have, obviously, if uh, you are dealing with a block, is that you are not just designing that block and materializing it afterwards, right? You can design and assemble simultaneously, right? So in this case, the software that the students generated uh, is uh, basically com composing or try trying to um, fit the requirements for a certain object. In this case, it's a, it's a chair. So we're just indicating you know, the, where, where we need to have a surface, when it, we need to have a back seat, right? And, and, and the, the algorithm is resolving the combinatorial process of these identical pieces so that they can first be assembled with a robot to the structure requirements. Um, right, and, and, and this could generate an entire plethora of uh, uh, different objects, depending on the kind of situation that you are uh, trying to solve, both structurally and uh, design-wise. Um, this also starts to open up a new discussion in automation, uh, which is uh, collaborating with the machine. Like, until what point you want to automate a process and where human intervention is actually more effective. Um, like in this case, you can track when those objects are, are positioned and you can basically design 
and give instructions to, to fabricate simultaneously, right? And at any point, that the, the digital piece and the physical piece are identical. So you can intervene in both. You can intervene in the digital process and, and change the way this structure will uh, grow. Uh, but you can also intervene in the physical process and algorithmically recreate a, a solution for that intervention. And uh, uh, we think that that's um, very, a very powerful kind of step in uh, automating the construction of, of architecture. You can as well start uh, dealing with a complete kind of different uh, de design uh, uh, methods where your agency can be regulated. Right. Uh, so in, in, in this case, for example, the chair on the left is completely author. Right. So someone kind of modeled it all, almost entirely. Right. Or, or there was a framework and then you can start like positioning pieces here or there. The second one is completely algorithm. Right? It's, it's the, the solution that the algorithm gave to a specific uh, process. And there is a, an entire gray zone right in between these two models where we can we can operate operate as architects. Um, so we normally test this in, uh, in the furniture scale. I will kind of talk about that quite a few times in, in the lecture. Uh, but we also start kind of entering the domain of, let's say, not architecture, but architectural elements to see how this process could uh, scale up. So it's, it, it doesn't scale up, but by blowing its scale up, right? Uh, but by multiplying these connections uh, farther, right? And geometry is indeed actually not, not, not the key, right? Uh, geometry is just, a, is just a driver for connectivity, but what is uh, important is the, the underlying syntax uh, in these aggregations, right? So in this case, the, this, this project and the previous one are incredibly similar uh, syntactically, right? It's just that the, the geometry is, is allowing a different kind of aggregation um, and at the same time is also driving a different kind of uh, out, auto, automation process, right? Uh, so because of these uh, softnets, for instance, we could start very easily uh, vacuuming uh, these pieces and uh, assembling them uh, together in this case in a, in a chair as well. You know, we, we, we test this a lot in chairs. Chairs are um, in incredibly like, uh, structurally complex. So they, they are very similar to a, a building in a very small scale, right? Like uh, you have compression, tension, and I will, I will kind of dig into this a little bit deeper uh, farther on in the lecture. But that is why uh, the chair is the ideal test for an architect with, uh, who is investigating a new design method or a new material or construction method. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of like tested this in, in a, a, a different uh, series of, uh, of objects. Um, but scaling up this process as well, we, we are dealing with other materials and other way of um, uh, conceiving these pieces. Like this is a, a project we did in, in collaboration with, with Lafarge a few, a few years ago in, in RC4, uh, where these pieces are cast concrete. So because it's a limited number of pieces, we can do like four different molds that would generate this very short variety that by uh, an incredibly, uh, like a, by its, their richness in the way they can combine with each other they can uh, create infinite variations at the architectural scale. Um, we did kind of simulate the um, robotic assembly on um, a, a part of, the, of this building, and, uh, and we did test it in a, in a larger architectural element. However, the, the ambition is uh, to see how this system could grow and expand and respond to different, different structural and special uh, conditions uh, to uh, create a, a, a different way of designing and building architecture. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's something that we have uh, kind of been exploring at, at different levels, not only with uh, large industrial heavy robots, but also uh, rethinking uh, what is the automation tool 
that would, will allow this highly distribution of feces, right? And this is a project we did back in the days with the, um, a, with the Unit 19 and, and also in Design Computation Lab with the Ivo Tedbury, uh, where he's uh, finding how this robot could position itself over a piece that is already there to then start establishing connections with the uh, following piece. Yeah, and, and, and these can produce architectures that uh, range from here, which you, you could even kind of identify as, as semi-classical, semi um, but, the, but the, the underlying method uh, to this is incredibly flexible, right? So uh, you, you can then now just rely on a single piece and a, sing, a single assembler right, uh, which uh, can really find a relationship between these two to create the architecture that is needed in, in a, a, certain, a certain condition. Uh, we've also, and uh, this is a little bit more, more recent work, uh, we've also started um, kind of uh, investigating what the, the ideal uh, construction robot for our discrete processes could be which of course will be a, a discrete robot. But in this case, for instance, is a, is a robot that is made out of identical pieces. Therefore, the robot can also recombine itself. So you start starting to, uh, you, you start associating the uh, kind of combination of, of pieces, not only for special requirements, but also for technical developments. In this case, how the robot will move, how the robot can assemble one piece to another, what kind of body plan you need to be able to take on that task. Um, like in, in, in this case, uh, we, we call this, uh, this project a, a pizza bot. Uh, so in this case, the, the robot and uh, the discrete piece are identical. Right? And, and we can start seeing, and this is, this is computed, it's not, it's not an animation, right? This is, it's, computing the path of all these uh, me mechanically augmented pieces, right? Uh, that can connect all the pieces that are not. And, and, and how, because of the, the, the body plans being identical, you can navigate better within your larger arrangement. And so, so this is actually an incredibly powerful mechanism because it's, it's not that we are adding motors and so on in every, every single component that makes the architecture. But actually, we are just localizing uh, our efforts to, let's say, in here, you can see the battery of, uh, of robots in the, in the sides. And, and you can leave the rest of the, of the bricks to be bricks, right? And they don't need to be smart bricks. They don't need to be expensive, complex. They can just be what they are best at, bricks. Um, at the same time, I think uh, automation is starting to uh, open up, uh, the, let's say, new, new, new frontiers for what an architect can, can play with and, and can explore. Um, not only in construction, but if, uh, if you envision this building that is made out of such a versatile system, right? Um, if we limit the number of pieces that make the building, and we automate the construction process, we can as well automate the recombinatorial process of a part of that construction. And that would allow you to have a certain flexibility and, uh, and envision a new use of the space that you just couldn't have before. Uh, so uh, lately in the next couple of years, we are coupling the development of, the, of this uh, design and construction systems with the development of platforms. Platforms that allow you to use the space differently to, for example, uh, amplify the, the usage of a single space uh, by um, uh, allowing its reconfiguration for a different program within the 24 hours of, uh, of a day. So what if uh, um, my space could be right now mine, but in a couple of hours could be an office, in a couple of hours could be something else, and maybe when I arrive, I just get an, another space that looks exactly the same, right? It's a topic to be kind of expanded to um, understand better. 
But this essentially, well, I think this kind of explains it a, a little bit better. So if your building is constructed out of uh, this specific robot and this specific piece, this piece can then move and alter its position and its function in relation with the user. And that, that is um, an, an, an incredibly fascinating new territory. For example, this is a, this is a project called Alice uh, that is, is envisioning that these spaces can occur parallelly in different parts of the world. Like, for example, you, you live in London and you are in an Alice building, uh, every time you go to that Alice building, you will have a space reconfigured for you until you leave. But if you go to another part of the world, the new space will also reconfigure itself to uh, assimilate or to, to fit your creativity and your, your special necessities. So I, I think this is starting to kind of establish a new dialogue in, uh, in more in relation to a uh, different way of living that we have, that we certainly have today during the, the crisis and that we will continue evolving uh, after this crisis is solved, meaning probably very soon, hopefully very soon. So this is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, one uh, single day in, in, in Alice, right? So that space was used as, a, as, a, as an apartment. And then while you are living, then it can get reconfigured just by very, very simple uh, moves with uh, a few of the pieces to become an office for, for someone else. And it could keep on that cycle according to the user's necessities. Uh, so therefore, you are actually amplifying the use of a space uh, um, dramatically, right? Because this, this building could be at 100 occupancy 24 hours. Uh, and we, we built a, a prototype of, a, of that system in, a, in the building center uh, uh, this year. Uh, but I mean, th this was basically configured out of these singular pieces that right now are uh, in, a, in a storage completely just uh, assembled uh, in a very efficient manner and just waiting for its new destination that is with a completely different configuration that is uh, uh, happening hopefully in a few months from, from now. And, and this process, and uh, with this, I think I, I finished this lecture. Um, yeah. So, and this process, again, like coming back to, to the, the, the kind of previous comparison of methods and materials, uh, this, this process could also deal with a different kind of materials and methods, such as, for instance, uh, 3D printing. This is a project that we are developing right now with the students in the, in the lab in UCL. And uh, this is work in progress still. They are uh, working on this uh, animation for a new version. But you can see uh, it's basically based on this efficiency on, on repeating the same uh, firmware, or very similar firmware, uh, but being able to use the advantages of 3D printing to con continuously print and iterate new pieces, right? And combine them in different ways. So it's a, it's a project that is, uh, is utilizing uh, these pieces as uh, 3D printed firmware, and they can be then rotated and be reutilized within the, the building again. I'm gonna leave like the la last part of the animation uh, just to play it slowly for like a
Okay, well, that was, it's, that's kind of like a, a hint of uh, what a, a 3D printed architecture could lead to, right? Um, yeah, again, this is a, a work in progress, so we will say very soon. And uh, uh, although I did uh, hint a little bit of a promo within the, within the animation, uh, you realize of the very, very cool uh, yellow, uh, very bright yellow uh, book on the, one of the tables. So you can as well have the, find the same uh, bright yellow in Amazon. It's an incredibly uh, interesting uh, book that I edited together with my colleagues. Uh, Monique Claypool, Dean Redson, and, and Vicente Soler, and that is uh, obviously describing uh, all all these uh, kind of um, uh, changes in in automation and, and design in much more uh, detail than what I could do in this uh, last hour. Um, so I think with that said, um, I I finished this first part of the lecture, and the second one will be more focus on, on, on Nagami and, uh, and on the, the link to some of the processes that I've been describing uh, before. So that, that's, the, that's the teaser for uh, uh, the next lecture will, that will happen in around five minutes or so. 